here watching a Gospel Project Sunday School lesson from Redbud Baptist Church. Redbud Baptist Church is located at 801 Slide Road in Lubbock, Texas, and Sunday School it starts at 9.30 a.m. every Sunday. Grab your Bible. Let's study together. Hey guys, this is the Gospel Project. We're in a I think it's chapter, uh, session 25 or unit 25, session 2. Uh, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, That's cool. what I got. Okay, and we're going to be in Luke today. And Brett Lilly's here to help us get through this today, and he's going to be leading the teaching. So I'm going to go ahead and pray and get started. You guys run, get your coffee, get your donut, grab your Bible, of course, and, and join us for a Bible study today. Um, this is going to be one that you recognize, but we're going to be talking a little bit more in depth about not just sort of the prodigal son, but also his brother and some other directions that they, they keep looking at to kind of tell us where our heart is today. Anyway, uh, thank you guys for joining with us. And I'm going to pray and get us started. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you. Lord, that we have your word, your scripture to guide us today. And Lord, you're sending your Holy Spirit to teach us. So Lord, let us follow the Spirit. Let your words be spoken. Let us take your word and apply it not only to our hearts, but our hands to our feet. Um, let us walk the walk and not just talk the talk, Lord. Lord, let this be not only a blessing to us, encouragement to us, guidance for us, but also for us to share with others around us. And Lord, let that start with them seeing Christ in each one of us. And let that move to a relationship, move to a chance to share the gospel to a chance to disciple people. Lord, just thank you for your word. Thank you for a chance to just go deeper in it. And Lord, thank you for the blessings we see and the ones we don't see. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, thank you James. No problem. Yeah, today we're talking, as James said, about uh, Jesus is telling the parable of the sons, and this is the third in the line of parables that Jesus was telling. Mm-hmm. Um, our background is Luke chapter 15, and we have uh, three in our outline here. The first covers Luke chapter 15, 11 through 13. The second is chapter 15, 17 through 24. And the last is uh, chapter 15, verses 25 through 32. So we're going to walk through this story. We all, I'm sure everyone remembers uh, the uh, parable of the prodigal son. Um, but we're going to chop that into three parts today, and we're going to see exactly what each part means. Because most people, I think, have a tendency to concentrate on the son himself who is coming back. And they don't really look so much at the father or his other son. But the story has equal importance with each person in the story. And we're going to read that here in a minute, and we're going to find out and talk more in depth about what each one means uh, to us. Now, this, this talks about um, a print of a Rembrandt masterpiece called The Return of the Prodigal Son. And I've actually seen the piece, not in person, but I've, I've seen it. Uh, and as they talk about it here, if you just look at the picture at a glance, uh, it doesn't really seem like much to it. But Rembrandt actually did capture the story in his photo or his picture, excuse me, right. that he painted. He, so, he painted so well, it looks like a photo. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so if you do, if you start to look at the detail uh, in the foreground, uh, there's illuminated. There's an illumination by some mysterious light, and it tells us the repentant son kneels before the compassionate father, who is embracing him. And that's the main focus of the painting, and most people's recollection of the parable, as we were saying. But to the right in the picture stands the prodigal son's older brother, yeah. with his hands folded, like kind of in a kind of a pattern, like, "Why are you acting this way? I'm over here. What about me? I've been good," kind of a thing. So. There are other details in the uh, painting that we could mention, too. But uh, we're going to talk about um, the father welcoming home his sinful son. And he's doing so with the equal love as he does his righteous son. Right. 
And so this does upset the righteous son, as we're going to find out. And we're going to talk about why that is. People like to put sins in categories, but we're going to find out why you can't do that. Right. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. So um, this story is going to talk. It's going to it's going to change your your attitude about what is sinful and what is righteous and what is our vision of the Father. So um, why why do people why do you, why does anyone think that the older brothers role in this story gets overlooked um probably because we're looking at uh we're actually looking at the prodigal son as being us coming to christ and things like that we so tend to project to, ourselves yeah. into the actual prodigal son correct instead of the brother but right. i think we're going to find out here in a minute we're closer to the brother than the after brother. reading more in depth in the gospel project and in, in this lesson i must say that I have to identify myself more with the older brother. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain a little more about that here in a few minutes yeah. when we get a little more into this. We're going to start reading in chapter 15, verses 11 through 13. And he tells them, he also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. Mm. Now, if you know about the time and the place that we are in here, um, it you did not ask for your inheritance. Your inheritance was something that you got when your father passed on. So, even though this looks kind of benign here, we have to look at a couple of things that are going on here. First of all, this was the youngest of the siblings that came to him. And so, basically, what he was saying to him at this point in time is that, because you didn't get any of this until the parent passed on. Right. So, he wants his share before the father passes on. So, in essence, what he's actually saying to him is, I wish you were dead so that I could get my inheritance. Yeah. There could but since be you're not, I'm going to ask you for it. Right. Which was a huge big no-no. But the father did it anyway. He gave it to him. Yeah, it's almost like he's saying that, that I'm, I'm giving up on you being my father. I mean, and, and, you know. Exactly. You're, you're not going to be taking care of me anymore because I want to have the inheritance and I want to mm -hmm. you know, be on my own and be myself at this point. I don't need you. And there's a specific reason that he wanted it because he wanted to go live a sinful life. Yeah. And he squandered every last bit of the estate yeah. that his father had given him. He Absolutely. left, did not have anything else to do with his family, and it says he squandered his estate. Hmm. So the, they tell us that Jesus did not provide a backstory for the events of the parable because there wasn't a necessary backstory to be told about this. The story within itself was enough to let the people know exactly why he was telling the parable. You know, we have to realize when, when they're putting this stuff together and when he's writing, when he's telling the parables, you know, they're trying to, mm -hmm. to write it as close to what happened with, uh, of course, God, you know, giving the words to yep. say and stuff, but it's going to be written where people during that time would understand it clearly. And we, we really see that mm -hmm. strongly when we get to Revelation and stuff, you know, yeah. all the stuff that's in there. Yeah, there, there's some stories that people, even the, the disciples, yeah, they had trouble understanding what it was. Why are you saying this, but how can that possibly be? And it's like, you got to look deeper into the story right. that I'm telling you. Write it down, read it, look at what I'm actually saying to you. Right. And of course, he's Jesus. Yeah. So everything that he puts into these stories, it's there. Yeah. You just have to find it if you and, know what you, you're looking for. And, and they usually know who they're talking about. I mean, you know, when he's talking to the yeah. Pharisees and, uh, you know, when uh, in the Old Testament, when the prophet was talking to them, you know, they, they know exactly 
this storyline they're using, like for David, you know, and the lamb, and you, you know, he took the lamb and, and you know used it mm-hmm. and, and all that stuff. And yeah, it opened like it, to the, open their eyes clearly. Yes, the Pharisees they could not understand when he was talking about right. rebuilding the temple in three days because their heart even after he uh, even after he was raised from the dead and he ascended to heaven, they still did not. Yeah, I think that was a willful. They were choosing uh, not looking, to. Yeah, they yeah. chose not to, to, to see that. So. so he didn't need a backstory for the uh, parable that he was taking right. or telling. The story just goes right into it. and But a small detail sets the stage for the young man's actions. He asked for his inheritance early, before his father's death. The younger son essentially told his dad, I wish you were dead. So that doing that, he dishonored and cut himself off from his father and family. This mm-hmm. family ties were a huge thing back then, big thing. And you could easily uh, estrange yourself from the family by doing something like that. Um, and he wanted to go and live for himself. And uh, that is the essence of every sin, both from the prodigal son and from us. We'll see what he did here in just a minute. Uh, in verse 13, Jesus said that the inheritance the son took early in his greed was squandered. So how did he squander it? He had a foolish lifestyle. What that lifestyle was, we don't know. We assume it was probably carousing, buying things he didn't need, and, and you know eating lavish meals or things like that. And pretty soon it was gone, living like that. Uh, same thing stands for today, too. Right. Um, so whatever experience or possession the son was chasing after in his new life came up short in reality. And the pursuit cost him everything, and he should have seen it coming. Here's the part where we step in here, I think. A lot of people, I think, it may not be to the same extent that it was with the prodigal son, like asking for your inheritance and whatnot. But a lot of times we drift away and we get caught up in things that we shouldn't be caught up in and we get lost and we start doing things we don't maybe not we don't consider them foolish things but they're not things of god right so and once you start drifting away it's easier to keep drifting away from it and we don't think of ourselves as being the part of the prodigal son even though we actually are drifting in that direction without realizing it it's like being in a boat not paying attention to the current, and all of a sudden you're 300 yards from the shore. Right. Um, So it tells us um, he should have seen it coming. But do we see it coming? Not often enough we do not see it coming. Right. A lifestyle of sin, whether public or private, one day will cost us everything. To live with yourself at the center rather than God is to live spiritually bankrupt and set yourself up for utter catastrophe and sorrowful emptiness. Uh, do we know people who have done that? Sure, I'm a. I think I'm a living example of that, but I won't go into that. Ad nauseum, I've gone into that. Um, now the son goes into a place where he thinks that he can turn everything back around, and a lot of us do that in our lives. We get to a point, and then we're like, "Oh, well, maybe I shouldn't be here where I'm at, or I, I can't believe I've done this." and what not, and I can get myself out of this situation, but that can never happen. Right. That can't happen. I see that a lot when we're doing that with God too. You know, it's like when I get all my stuff together, then I'll go back to church. Then I'll go back mm-hmm. to doing. You know, when I get it all together, you know, and because you know, right now I don't have it together, and, and I shouldn't be in church because that's where all the righteous people are. Yeah, and really, they don't realize that we're only righteous because of Christ, nothing else. <laughs> you yeah, know? we need people who are not righteous. That's yeah. the purpose of our church. Yeah, that's yeah. the that's, and, that's our mission. That's and everybody in there is a sinner. <laughs> you know, so. Exactly. But that's kind of how we get. So we can rationalize the highs of his licentious living and say that they were too addictive. But squandering his material possessions landed him in a pigsty. Literally. One of the worst <laughs> places. That's Yeah, it says here that's one of the worst places a Jew could land because pigs were unclean by law. That's found in Deuteronomy. What's worse, he was so hungry that he wanted to eat the slop the pigs were eating. So that was the end of a life oriented around himself. Yeah, And a lot of people, I think, find themselves in that. 
And I think that when they find themselves in that, they've gotten so far away from God that they don't realize that they need the Lord to get themselves back where they need to be. Right. And they just, they end up there and they sit there. And I think that that's where we as a church need to be able to come in. And we need to be able to spot this. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are having a lot of suffering, a lot of, a lot of it self-induced. Right. And we need to be able to recognize that and extend the, the hand of the Lord to them through us. You know, I mean, I think that's where um, small groups come into a very effective area, oh, yes, you know, yes. because you're going to notice the person, notice the person you're changing or noticing the person not yeah. showing up and you're going to be calling them up, you know, because, uh, you know, and it could be your Sunday school, too. I mean, you know, yeah, uh, as long as it's not too big of a sc Sunday school. But, you know, if you have like five to ten people in a group that's studying together, man. Man, something's gone on with John. I don't know what's going yeah. on with John. You well, know, you know, let's go check up on him great, and stuff. Yeah. But when you have small groups like that, it's a more intimate relationship that yeah. you form with people. Yeah. And I think that they can feel more at ease because people, people for as a whole, I think are are closed off. Oh yeah. And they don't want to let you into the innermost parts when, of when their life. When you start life, getting out there to nine or ten people, they're going yeah, to start because they have up. pride and there's dignity issues right. and all kinds of other stuff that they don't want you to know about. Even you know when they come to the church, they're they're expecting um, that they need to look a certain way, and mm -hmm. and and we don't help that because we yeah. try to look a certain way. You know what I'm saying? We, we're, exactly. we're just we, we, we portray a certain image, and we don't yeah. want that shattered. Yeah, yeah, no, you, know, you, you don't have that. No. Kind of vulnerability. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? You need that vulnerability, and you need to be broken sometimes. Yeah, but I think you know when you get down to the smaller groups, yeah, they open up more. Yes. Uh, you know what 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 could be affecting someone. And you can help them, encourage them. You know, an uh, older spiritual person helping a younger spiritual person, if you will. Sure. You know, sure. Um, pouring into another person. Leading and guiding. That's. I mean, once you when you are a Christian and you are maturing in your Christian life, um, we're not to just we're not to keep God to ourselves. No. <laughs> you know, if you do see someone like that, don't think to yourself, "Well, that's none of my business. I don't need to butt in there." There are lots of different ways that you can ask people things that you can show support for people and let them know that you're there for them. it may take several years yeah. if someone's in a certain place for them to re make a realization you know it's not always you're just going to go up and talk to someone like you're at a billy graham crusade right you know that's we all wish that would happen i certainly wish that would happen but you know that it's just not going to happen and sometimes it's slowly over time i have someone that i work with that i that i'm slowly yeah. Kind of interjecting a little bit here and there, and hopefully they can see. And, and I mean, you know what I'm doing because I know that there's things going on in their life that I can't just go up and ask them about. Yeah, it's I, not a I, relationship I that like that. Too. You know, with the Facebook stuff. I mean, you yeah. know, I've been putting out some stuff about reaching people for you know, yeah. reaching for inviting them to church and reaching for Christ. But you know, we we kind of get you know we'll, we'll watch those uh, pure flicks movies and stuff like that, and that person turns. They're right around, and they, they accept Christ, and yeah. all, all of a sudden they start reading and memorizing the Bible, and they become this great preacher or whatever. And it usually doesn't happen that way, you know. No. And you may go through a dozen people before one accepts Christ. Now, that's not saying that one of those other ones might not accept Christ further down yeah. the road, or some other time they'll come. Hey, you were talking to me one time about this, but you know, there's planting the seed and there's making it grow and things like that. But that's not a time to give up ever. I mean, no, no, you never of, give up. You you can't give yeah. up because Don't God didn't give up on us. Yeah. And let me tell you, no matter how many times I've screwed up, the Lord has always been there for me. Yeah. All I had to do was reach up and grab his hand. Yeah. And you know, we're just prime examples that you know, sure. if he if he could save us, he could save anybody. You know, <laughs> because that's exactly right. Because the Jane before Christ was really, really, really bad. So Yep. Absolutely yeah. correct. Okay. Well, let's go on. Yeah. And we're going to talk about our point number two, which is found in chapter 15, verses 17 through 24. Uh, sorrow leads to repentance in light of the Father's goodness. Mm. And we're going to read this, and then we're going to kind of dissect it and talk about what's contained within here. Uh, verse 17 begins, 
when he came to his senses, we're talking about the son, the prodigal son now. Yeah. He said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? Yeah. And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Mm. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, that's important too. While the son was a long way off, right. his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran through his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Mm. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So first off, what was the prodigal son thinking? Well, he's thinking, you know, it'd be better to be a slave at my dad's house. Exactly. Because they eat more and he, he's just eating what yeah, the pigs I mean, he eat there. Knew, the yeah. thing of it was he knew that he had estranged himself and separated himself from his father and his family by the act that he committed by asking for his inheritance and taking off. Yeah. So by, by doing that, he thought that he was not going to be received back and that maybe, just maybe, they might let him have a crumb from the table, basically, being one of the, the slaves. Right. His father. At least they had something to eat. Correct. You know, and they weren't having the, well, maybe they were feeding the pigs, but it wasn't like he was actually having, somebody else actually hired him that was supposed to be doing it. He was doing it for them. Yeah. So when he comes back, this is his train of thought. This is his, his mode of thinking when he comes back. But what we're going to learn here, this father, and I'm sure that this is true of most fathers, most fathers with families. No matter, and I, I have a little bit of a personal issue with this too because um, – I have a sibling whom this was a recurrent thing, and he was older than me. And uh, I could never figure out why in the world uh, my dad would keep on letting him back in and letting him back in, even though he was constantly doing things that weren't right, right and correct. And I was, you know, uh, according to me, um, from your unbiased I was standpoint. Like, yeah, I was like, yeah, from unskilled, I was like, well, I don't do all of that stuff. I've never done anything that bad and whatnot. And I'm like, I'm here and I, I see after people and do this and that and the other. And I haven't done that. So from my vantage point, it was like, well, I'm doing all this stuff. Why should I do this? You know, when he's, you know, keeps coming back. But it, it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I actually, and I'm, I'm 50. I just turned 50. So. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I was 48 when I had this realization. Better, better late than never. Yeah, when I had this realization of like, well, because my son's now 14, and I'm like, is there really much that your kids could do that is so unforgivable that you can't forgive them? We may not have the capacity to show the same kind of mercy that the Lord shows towards us. Right. But in that same way, my father and my mother, to to a certain extent, did that for my brother. And it took me so long to figure out why. It's because he was he was coming back to them. You know, it was like he went away and did something that he shouldn't have been doing, and then he came back. You know, so there was something there for him. And they were his parents. What were they going to do? They loved him. Right. You know, exactly. I mean... I mean, even sometimes when they let a child go, they're doing it out of love. Sure. You know, I mean, they're not, you know, they don't want them to go. There's sometimes, a, sometimes they'll, they'll turn them over to yeah. the world to, so they can understand and come back. Exactly. Which, and you, yeah. when you hear Jesus talk about this too, you have to be thinking, you know, what was the father thinking mm -hmm. when he gave the, the son his inheritance and then he left? That had to have hurt. 
mm-hmm. you know, not only the thought that he was, you know, in essence saying, I wish you were dead, but it, it just had to hurt, you know, watching him go away. So when he came back, and he was not he was not only coming back to his father, he was repentant of what he had done. He was repentant of squandering the inheritance. Right. He was repentant of even asking his father to do such a thing. Mm. And so what did the father do? When he saw him from afar, he went to him yeah, and embraced the son. Ran there to him. He ran there to him. He was so happy to see him back again. He's like, you came back. And then he repented to him. And he was like, no way. That's not going to happen. You're not mm-hmm. going to be my slave. You're going to you're going to be my son again and we're going to have a feast and we're going to celebrate that you're back. That's what he's telling them. And if you look at the story, who is the father in this story? It's the Lord. It's the Lord. It's, it's the exact story of the Lord. So, what what is the father in this story showing the son? Uh, unconditional love. <laughs> and he's being merciful. Merciful, yeah. When the son deserved something we, we, we very call it different. Grace, you know? <laughs> yes, the son deserved something very different. He deserved to be treated with indignance and he deserved to be punished. For what he maybe had done. not even having a, exactly. a, a servant so or a slave. This, this is us. Mm-hmm. And we have to come to the Lord and repent of what we have done because the Lord wants to give us grace and he wants to give us mercy. That's why he sent his son to die on the cross for us. I mean, that was the ultimate act of love. I know, I know you like to do the voices from the church. And in here it says repentance does not mean just feeling sorry for what we've done. It involves action. It means moving back toward God, humbly confessing of our sin to him and receiving his forgiveness and restoration. Uh, when we do these things, God welcomes us back to himself, forgives our sin and redeems what we've lost. When we were away from him. And that's Tony Evans. So yeah. a lot of the ones we've done is like guys from way back in the past. And, you know, yeah, of course, they're, you not, know. <laughs> they're not very recent people. That but, people but me and you have actually probably to. seen Tony Evans yes. and, and heard him preach. Yeah. And, and you could just see him talking about that. But, yeah, it actually involves the, the, the humility, the humble part, the actual turning back. You know, uh, when, when someone says they're sorry mm-hmm. and they're just going to say it again, do it again, say they're sorry again. And that's kind of. The things that you've seen, yeah. maybe in, in your brother from your point of view, and and now this prodigal son, he's actually coming back totally humble, totally like I screwed up, and seeking forgiveness. And so that's how it is, you know, with the Lord too. If we yeah. humbly approach Him, accept Christ as our Savior, you know, we're we're sinners, we're fallen. And another another thing that strikes me in this part of this story is that. He accepted the forgiveness that his father was giving him. Yeah. He didn't sit there and say, I am I am unworthy of this. I can't do it. And a lot of people today say yeah. that. They're like, I am so unworthy of this. I could never repent. I could never do this because the Lord would never love someone like me. And, and that makes us fall in a couple areas, I think. Yes. Um, because we either have the, the situation where you ask Christ as your Savior and you truly believe that. But you keep asking him, you keep asking him again. I mean, yes. I know uh, J.D. Greer has something out there talking about, you know, quit asking for the Lord to save you, you know. Yeah, and, and that's a that's a problem, I think, with several right. people. It has been a problem with me in the past. You can't forget about your past and accept the forgiveness that the Lord right. is giving you. So you're basically torturing your own self. As far as the east is Lord, from the west. Yeah, you know? the Lord is like... It's already gone. So why do you keep dwelling upon because, that? Because, and that's my second point. We start listening to the enemy because the enemy yes. is going to bring that up all the time. And I think part of that is Satan. That I is. think Satan puts those, those those thoughts in our mind, yeah. and that blocks us off, and he delights in that. And that would bring us to why people think they have to work for their salvation too. Yes. And there's there's no work involved. Nope. Christ has done all the work. All we have to do is trust in it. Grace is just given. There is nothing in gift. return for it. Yeah. So that's what I think starts happening in these situations. We never really, uh, rec- you know, fully receive his forgiveness. We really never uh, think of it that way. And so we, we, we keep allowing those older stuff to come back and bother yeah. us. And really 
God's taking care of that. You know, we're not going to send Christ back up to the cross again. He covered it all. Yep, it was yeah. covered once and for once all. Once and for all. So, so he didn't. He's the, yeah. He, he didn't sit there and say the reason Christ died on the cross. Before that, people mm. had to give burnt offerings all of the time to atone for their sins. And Jesus, and the Lord said, "No, I'm going to send my Son, and once and for all, we're covering everything. This is it. All you have to do." is genuinely ask and repent yeah that's it uh james i did not know this do you know what the word prodigal actually means what it mean? says here it's an adjective referring to profuse expenditures and a sense of wastefulness really i mean i always put it in a different something like uh, i thought it meant the returning son or, or the yeah you know yeah. <laughs> The, the the one that was missing before and now is present, yeah. you know, something like that. But uh, wow, <laughs> prodigal is actually yeah. for the way for that him they, being wasteful. And, yeah, the way that they phrase it in here, um, so of course, they, they say it's it's of course applied to the the younger son who squandered his inheritance. But then it says maybe we should see the father in this story as the most prominent prodigal as he wastes his affection on his disgraced son, lavishing his goodness upon the one deserving of his, of his condemnation. So mm. as pastor and author Tim Keller says, the image of the gospel we receive in this parable of the prodigal son is actually of the prodigal God, who loves us, his sinful children, with overwhelming abundance as he gives us his son, and by extension, he generously gives us all things. Yeah. All things. Yeah, um, and I can't think of it at this moment, but we do have that one song out there that uh, where we can't believe God would love us this way. It's like, you know, his foolish love. And I mm -hmm. mean, some people will have problems with that, saying the word foolish there, but that's not what we're saying. Saying this is this does not make sense from a human yeah. point of view. And, and we're going to we'll see in a minute, the older brother feels exactly, exactly that way. Yeah. Why are you wasting your affections yeah. on him? Yeah. It's not, you know, it's it's one of those things that only God can understand. Mm -hmm. And praise the Lord, he does have that type of uh, grace for us, that type of love for us, because if it was up to us, we'd let ourselves drop. You know? Yep, we sure would. <laughs> you know, we and, absolutely and God, would. So it, it's something I don't think we'll fully understand until we're with him and his presence and knowing that Christ has covered us. That's right. Okay. We're going into our third point, which is chapter 15 in Luke, verses 25 through 32. Self-righteousness leads to resenting the Father's goodness. Mm. Now, self-righteousness. I know a lot of us don't believe that we are self-righteous. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm stepping on my, my own toes here. Mine too. And uh, I'm just going to read it. And we'll, uh, we'll dissect it. Verse 25 says, Now his older son was in the field. Mm -hmm. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him. Yeah. And your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, Look, mm. I have been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a goat that I could celebrate with my friends. But when it, the son of yours came, the son of yours, I like that one, mm -hmm. who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. The father then said to his son, Son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. What is the sin of the older brother here? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be righteousness. It's going to be he's, jealousy. He's feeling self righteous, and the problem yeah. is he feels that his good deeds while he was with his father, should have earned his father's favor. Right. But that is not the point. He's, uh, when, you're, when you're close to the Lord, 
and someone else is not. How much does the Lord rejoice when that one person comes to yeah. be with the Lord? Yeah, we do have you are already with the, the Lord. one sheep that's out he there. He rejoiced when you yeah. joined him. You are with him. You are in the company of everyone else. You get to study him. You get to be with him. You get his comfort. You get his grace. You get his mercy. So you're already there. So you need to be rejoicing with the Lord. Yeah. And the salvation of someone else who's come. Celebrating that someone got So instead of being saved, happy yeah. for his brother coming home and celebrating with his father, he was indignant about it and basically crossed his arms and was like, I've done this and I've done that. What's the problem with that? I, I, I. Have... It kind of has a little bit of the Jonah feel to it. You know, we, we always talk about, you know, he's in the belly of the fish and... Uh, you know, he turns and goes and does what God tells him to do and everything mm -hmm. like that. But we always forget to add in the other part where he goes off and sulks about it. You know, of course, the flower grows, provides shade and wilts and stuff. And God's trying to wake him up and see, hey, look, you know, these hundreds of thousands of people got saved today. You're over here pouting under this little, you mm -hmm. know, wilted tree and everything. And, and, and really, the idea is you should be celebrating all these people. And, of course, you know, he's looking at, well, these are are my enemies, I didn't like him anyway, and all that stuff. Yeah. But, but uh, and he knew that God was going to be gracious, gracious on them if uh, they turned from their ways. And I think that's the same thing we see, and we see it throughout the Bible in places, you know, where oh, it, the story repeats itself. It, yeah, but people don't really pay attention. No, to that. no. And I think part of this was also aimed at the Pharisees and the Sadducees, yeah. because a lot of those, most of them. Should have been were, celebrating. <laughs> yeah, but well, a lot of them became self-righteous like this, and they thought yeah. that what they were doing, their works that they were doing, were somehow going to get them closer to God. Yeah, and, and, and see, they they should have been the first ones to realize, uh, because of how well they knew the Scripture, that God was fulfilling, I mean, Jesus, while on earth, was fulfilling all these things that were in the Old Testament, one after another, after another, after another, after another, after another. And in their self righteousness and their self, you know, walk, going through the motions, yeah. you know, I do all these things and I do this and I do these works and everything like that. They were not willing to fully open up their eyes to see what he had, that he was the Messiah. And yeah, um, yeah that's, uh, it fits it perfectly. But we're in here too. I mean, <laughs> But we are definitely exactly. in here too, you know? Yeah, I don't mean to say that uh, this category is just for one people. I just meant at the time when Jesus Absolutely. was telling us yeah. that I think it was it was had was pointed toward them at right. the time too. Yeah. And now it's just as applicable to us in every um, era of history. This story mm -hmm. has been applicable to every single group up till now, and after we're gone, it's going to be applicable. To everyone after this too right right so that's where we are with him so uh again the father is explaining to the oldest son why he should be rejoicing he was dead and is alive again he was lost and now he was found mm. so um they also talk about because in this in this day they had a lot of sheep herders and they he talks jesus talks to them in other parables too and he asks them if you're a sheep herder if you have one lost sheep do you not do everything in your power to go and find that you leave the sheep you have and you go and find that sheep and when you find that sheep you're happy and you're rejoicing and you bring that sheep back into the fold yeah well when you're not talking about sheep and you're talking about humans and the Lord brings one back into the fold. We should all be yeah. rejoicing when yeah. we're here in church or anywhere else. And we know of someone that comes to uh, accept the Lord as their personal Savior. We should all be rejoicing about that. If it's one person in a year or two years, it doesn't matter. We should be rejoicing just as if we're bringing in 200 people a year. Mm. And they're all accepting the Lord as their Savior. Because... The Lord says that uh, the Bible says that the Lord will rejoice just as much in one person, person coming to the Lord as He will a thousand, a multitude. Yeah, a multitude of people. Uh, on page twenty-three of your guys's quarterly, it does have the fill in your blanks. It says God is gracious. Yep. God's nature 
is to delight in giving unmerited favor to those who are undeserving. Because of sin, we deserve death. But God has demonstrated his graciousness by providing atonement and forgiveness for our sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So the fill in the blanks are nature, unmerited, and forgiveness. So, yeah. And, we, you know, in, in the same era area here, I think that it's a, a slap in the face to the Lord. He sent his son to die to cover all of our sins. And when we don't accept that, yeah. that I think that that really, you know, I think that the Lord can cry. I think that he can feel emotion. And I think that when we don't do that and we intentionally don't accept what he is offering, that, you know, we've all had that ourselves, you know. We offer somebody something and we know that it's the best thing for them. But yet they continue to sit there and go, no, no, I'm just not going to do well, that. Um, in Hosea, we see a little bit of that. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, basically he, he was to marry the, the prostitute, Gomer, and um, he, he see, you know, he gets to see what a little bit of what God feels like, at least in the human terms. Yep. Uh, when, you know, he loves this person incredibly, but this person is totally unfaithful to him. And, and you know, so we get to see that, yep. you know, where we're not being faithful to the Lord and uh, we, we put other um, idols in front of that, you know, uh, Carlos was talking about that, you know, last week and the week before, yeah. you know, we put other things in place of God. The priority of that list gets moved down. Um, and, and yeah, he's a jealous God, you know? And uh, so we know that he does ha have, um, you know, um, even through Israel and all that stuff. And, and, you know, he had to keep turning them over to uh, oh, yeah. be, be conquered. Or, they kept breaking his heart. And, um, to the point, the 400 years that you don't hear from him at all, and then on into the New Testament when yeah. Christ is here, and yet there's, you know, as we get farther along, and we see in Revelation even, you know, where he's talking about these different churches, and they lost their first love, and so yeah, that theme, uh, Brett, is all through the Bible. It's kind of yeah. uh, sad, but but you also have the exciting scene, uh, theme all through the Bible about those who are accepting his forgiveness and get saved. And, um, you know, from Old Testament through the New Testament, yeah. there, there's that, that line uh, of people that are, are going to be watching, watching, you know, walking in that narrow path to heaven. And it's not because we're, we're righteous, it's because we're made righteous yeah. because of Christ. Nothing that we did. That's right. Yeah. And as a little side note, guys, um, I think the same thing is true with our pastors here. Now, I'm not trying to compare them with the Lord, but they try and they try and they try. And this is their life's mission. They've made it their life's mission. Yeah. And uh, if you think it doesn't hurt them mm. when people don't respond, you're absolutely wrong. So I talked to Carlos about this yesterday, too. So. But anyway, <laughs> that that is just one of those things. So remember your pastors. And they're the ones who are trying to convey this message to you. And as I said, they made it their life's mission to do this. They love the Lord so much. And they wanted to see people come to Christ yeah. so badly that they devoted their, their entire lives to doing this. Mm -hmm. So remember that when you are praying and, and pray at for the, your pastors. At the very least, they're trying to equip the saints so the saints could be exactly. preaching them. But, exactly. but, but even on, on a... Uh, even with that said, you know, we can, we, uh, as our, our part too, you know, we're trying to reach people for Christ too. And, sure. And, you know, yeah. it's, you know, we, we probably meet just about as many people yeah. as you do. It's not anything special just because you're a pastor um, because you can only reach so many people a day anyway yeah. that you can see and stuff like that. But man, if everybody in the church is reaching people for Christ, then we're mm -hmm. going to get to be, you know, celebrating a lot because people are being, yeah. you know, I don't know if it's a percentage. I don't know what it is. It seems to happen, but 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 it seems like the more times you're out there reaching people for the Lord, the more people are going to be accepting. So um, it, it's it's a hard it's hard. God says it's hard, 
Yeah. You know, just the fact that, that we have Christ as our Savior, you know, if they're resentful to Christ, they're going to be resentful to us. How much more, you know? So in this world right now, it, it's twisted right now. And, it, you know, it's nothing new under the sun, nothing that the Bible doesn't say is going to be happening. Yeah. It's, it's there. There's no surprises. If you, if you know your Bible and you've studied God's Word, you know that there's no surprises. And, right now. and there's other parts of the world that, you know, Christians are getting a lot more persecution than, than we see. I have a lot more of that hill climb than what we see. So, guys, it's this is the time to be reaching people because who knows what tomorrow's going to bring? How much longer are we going to be able to keep our church doors open? Well, a lot open, more people, you know? I think, now are, are looking for answers. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And not to say that we have all of the answers, but we do have the answer. The one that has the answer. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So. Exactly right. So... Uh, the parable of the prodigal son is as much about the older son's legalism absolutely, as the younger son's hedonism. There you go. And it tells us our Heavenly Father's goodness is not contingent upon the law. Mm -hmm. So but what does that mean? That means we can't work our way into heaven. No. That's never going to happen. No, if you guys can hold yeah. the Ten Commandments, that's surprising because, you you know, we no exactly. one can except for Christ. I don't know anybody Christ. not one ever that so. hasn't broken at least one one commandment and if we go to the sermon on the mount we know that you know even lust in your heart you know yeah. <laughs> you committed a sin so uh we Absolutely know that right. none of us can meet that and, and we can only we experience short. the lord's goodness through his grace yeah, through it. and which is given freely and it Absolutely. says here unmerited favor which is the only way it can happen anyway yep. if you had to work for it one, it wouldn't be grace. Well, yeah, two, there wouldn't, there wouldn't two be we wouldn't get it. there either because yeah. we still wouldn't work that hard to get there. And um, the only way it could happen was the plan that he set from the beginning. And that's for Christ to be. That's absolutely right. Sacrificial lamb. Yeah. So. Um, hmm. They talk about the Jewish custom of the oldest son was the honor bearer of the family. Yeah, he's the one that's going to get the the blessing and going to get twice yeah. the inheritance. You know, we we know all that from Isaac and Jacob and stuff. And yeah, so there's going to be a lot of stuff uh, that should be going down uh, through the oldest brother. And yeah, so he wasn't the first older brother to. He didn't. I wouldn't say break with the tradition, but bro he broke with what he was supposed to be doing. Right. Uh, it asks us, what are some ways Christians can exhibit a legalistic worldview? Mm. Goodness. I mean, you know, we do have people that are trying to um, hold to something they can't hold to. Uh, I think so, too. Yeah, you know, it's like uh, it talks about um, putting up your own standards. Right. You know, that you're trying to live up to it. A lot of times you put yourself up there and there are just things that you're you're trying to live up to a certain standard all the time and so you're setting yourself up to fail absolutely from that yeah yeah so i think sometimes you have to step back and say look i can't be everything to everyone at all times and i i certainly can't be this person that i think i have to be all of the time right but i can do some of it some of the time yeah. and work towards doing that and I mean, really, it's it's surrendering to God and following God's lead. Yeah. Not our own lead, not trying to make ourselves better so we can be um, good for God or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. allowing God to work through us through the Holy Spirit. And that's the only way. So, you know, it's more to do with humility, surrendering, spending time in prayer, spending quiet time, all yeah. these things that we seem to... Uh, I guess, uh, get our busy schedules in the way of, yeah. And, uh, have to realize that we need to go back and, you know, like they say at that point, you know, uh, go back to where we knew we were with God, realign ourselves. And yeah. Start because sometimes in, until you go back to where you were, you don't remember what it was like, kind of like a map. to be there. <laughs> and then when you get back there, you're like, oh man, I should have never left this, yeah. this spot, you know, and you just keep trying again. To not do it, you know, because we're human, obviously, and we were born into a sinful world. Yeah. That doesn't mean that we have to uh, wallow in a sinful world and mm -hmm. remain there. It says here, uh, what do you need to repent of so 
come to the Father in a humble faith? And that's a question you guys can answer there where you're at. How can your group or church or um, small group or Sunday school exhibit a welcoming culture of grace towards sinners who repent? You know, this would be the older brother welcoming yes. back the, the prodigal son in celebration. Uh, how will you share the gospel message of God's grace in Jesus with the sinful prodigals of self-righteousness, older brother, you know, and self-righteous older brother, you know. So, um, you know, there's two things that we're seeing here. And that's, of course, you know, that the, you know, the prodigal son, how they, he turns and becomes humble and how the, the older brother becomes self-righteous and legalistic. And mm -hmm. so you have two things going on that we can learn from. And of course, we can see the father there that's, you know, loves them both, um, would welcome them both anytime. And uh, God's that yeah. way. He's that loving father. So. And D.L. Moody tells us every sinner has a false idea of God. Yeah. He thinks God is not ready and willing to forgive him. He says it's not justice, but God wants to deal in mercy. Yeah. If we had justice, we would not want None of us. the justice that, <laughs> yeah. that we deserve. Mm -mm. So God stands ready and willing to receive you to his bosom and forgive you freely yeah. with no conditions. No conditions, no conditions whatsoever. Yeah. So I know it's some people think that's too too uh too easy. Too easy. Gotta be more to it. Gotta be more to it. It's too good. You know, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. On and on and on and on. And you know, it's just one of those things that shows just how much he does love. I mean, you know, he set us here in the first place. He he provided, you know, I love the, the scientific side of that where you're talking about the earth seems to be in the mm -hmm. perfect rotation, perfect place to supply us everything we need to survive. The temperatures, the water, the nutrition, yep, exactly. on and on and on. And man, isn't that just lucky that it happened that yeah, way? Yeah, it's absolutely lucky. <laughs> no. So lucky. No. It you know, all fell right into place. I have a lot of respect for those scientists that uh, look to the Bible to say, wow. I yeah. see God really working in creation and nature and everything that's going on here. And it just. And God gave us a scientific mind. Yeah. That, you know, science does not. Um, it's not uh, exclusive. Of yeah. No, God's I mean, but it, it, it doesn't like eliminate God. It yeah. actually reinforces incorporates it, it, it. it being there. So anyway, that's this extra stuff there. Bonus. Yeah. Bonus, <laughs> bonus footage. Um, all right, we're gonna we come to the time where we're gonna close in our prayer. So, guys, if you all yeah. will uh, bow your heads, Father, let our prayer be that of prodigal sons and daughters whom you have rescued. We thank you for your generous older brother Jesus, your eternal Son, mm. whose sacrifice entitled us to share in his inheritance. Send your Holy Spirit ahead of us to lead others towards you. Yes, Lord. The God who loves and forgives both wayward prodigals and self-righteous Pharisees through the preaching of the gospel. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Yeah, let us open our eyes so we can see those around us that need Christ. And let us celebrate when they accept Christ as their Savior. Exactly. <laughs> you know? And his inheritance, the inheritance that the Lord has left us is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're glad you guys are with us today. And, and uh, you know, the prodigal son is, is just, you know, it's one of the earliest stories we learn about, you know, in the yeah. Bible. And it never gets old. And it's actually continues to remind us this is what we need to be doing because we do get yep. righteous, self-righteous, legalistic, all that stuff. And every once in a while, it's good for the Lord to take us and bring us back down and remind us, you know, there are sons that we're still, and daughters, that we're supposed to be reaching and um, get them back home. So we anyway, love you guys. Take care. Uh, come be part of the Sunday school here whenever you get a chance. And uh, I'm glad you're tuning in and still keeping up with the, uh, your Explore the Bible and the Gospel Project in this case. So I'm glad you guys are here. Thank, Thank you all for letting me come. And I miss everyone in my Absolutely. class and everyone in the church. Absolutely. I mean, come, you know, come come be a part of it. When you feel safe, come be a part of this again. You know, um, there's still a lot of stuff for us to do, but there's a lot of people to be saved. And, man, I'm waiting for those baptismal waters to be flowing again, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, <warm>. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> It'd be awesome. Goodbye, guys. We love you. Bye.